we're glad that we live in a nation where we get to hear the gospel freely. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter number 3. And while you're turning there, let me just mention a couple things, uh, just by way of announcement. Um, I want you to remember in prayer, if you would, these. Let's pray for Elaine Busho, who is in the hospital of pneumonia, and then they put her husband in with chest pains, Brother Milford. So they're both at Stones Crest Hospital. We're praying for, for them. Also, Clara Harrison, Harris, who has been hospitalized uh, this week, and then also praying for Bob Moore, uh, who was uh, uh, waiting to... Uh, find out what the doctors will do with his uh, uh, tumor they found and took off his uh, 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 bladder. We're praying for him, also Marilyn Wilson. And then I got these notes um, just right before church. I want you to pray for Brother Wes Dempsey, his brother-in-law, uh, Daryl Stewart, and his uncle, Lance Smith. Both passed away yesterday. And so let's pray for Brother Wes and his family and uh, ask God just to encourage them. And uh, then also I got this note, and that is that Daniel and Alicia Williams are the, uh, uh, have a new baby, Elena Grace Williams, 7 pounds, 3 ounces, 20 inches long, born Friday at 11.30 p.m. And grandparents, Ivan and Alice Games, and we rejoice in this new little baby, amen? And we're thankful for that. So we have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to be praying about, and then... Uh, our missions conference started really in Sunday school. Many of you had a chance to get to meet our missionaries and um, in your class. And all of the uh, children will uh, each night uh, starting, I think, tonight. Does the kids program start tonight? Starting tonight, kids program over in the fellowship hall. And, man, they've got that thing set up. It's exciting when they go in over there. And if you're a parent, uh, I'm praying that, that if you think about staying home Monday through Wednesday that your kid comes home and says, Nope, Mom, get in the car. We're going to church because this thing's set up for kids as well. We don't want them to be excited about their mission, and uh, you be praying about all of that. And uh, then I probably should have you uh, direct you to uh, something that's very, very important this week. That is this mission card. I'd like for you all to look, look for that right now. It was either in your bulletin and, uh, or it is in your brochure that you received just a moment ago. And I want you to find that. I want you to pull that out right now because we'll say something about this Every service, uh, Dr. Don Fisk, who is the uh, Director Emeritus of BIMI, Baptist International Missions Incorporated, will be our keynote speaker Monday through uh, Wednesday. And we always enjoy hearing Dr. Sisk, his wife, and home to be at the Lord this past year. And uh, so uh, he is going it alone right now. And I want you to hear him. I want to be an encouragement to Brother Sisk, as well as all of our missionaries this week. We support nearly 180 different works and uh, we're grateful for that, and we're looking to add it to that in a big way. And so the missionaries are here this week. We uh, fully anticipate them joining our mission family. But in order for us to do that, we have to raise this uh, commitment every year. And so this is for one year, this commitment card. And let me just say this. This is from your pastor's heart. To me and to God, this is solid gold this week. This card is solid gold. So don't just put it back in your Bible and forget about it. Don't leave it laying in the chair. Don't take it home and not bring it back because we'll see to it you get another one. I promise you. Uh, these, these mean so much. This is how we set our budget every year. And some of you say, well, I think I'll just kind of do it the way I want to do it. Well, we'll go ahead, but we want you to join in what we're trying to do as a church family. This is our annual missions conference. And so if everybody will cooperate, uh, we'll be able to go over our goal this year. We, we do it every year. Sometimes it takes a Sunday or two to get it all in. But uh, uh, we'll do that on Wednesday night. So Wednesday night will be the blockbuster night. But we'll start taking these up uh, today. If for some reason you cannot be back for any of the services, you pass that this card in today. If you can't come back, may uh, bed bugs infest your armpits before nightfall. <laughs> Honestly, some of you, for whatever reason, you can't be back, and we fully understand that. But if you're not coming back because you just don't come to church at night, then I refer you back to the bed bug statement. Because this is really the most exciting conference we have all year. Let me just say this on behalf of our missionaries. They may not say it, and if they do, I'd be totally embarrassed if they said this to me. But whenever we see the crowd tonight, and we see the crowd Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I like that to be a good, strong crowd. Because you're saying to them, you're important to us. And you're saying to Christ that missions is important to us. And so for three extra nights out of the year, we want to ask you if you'll attend and let God speak to your heart. These missionaries will be sharing their burden every night starting tonight 
By the way, tonight's big city night. Where's Brother Dice at? Where's Brother Dice? Would you all stand up right there? Serving in New York City. Let's give them a good hand. Tonight, you're going to get to hear from them. Thank you all. You may be seated. Uh, I, I got cold chills running down my spine right now. I watched your video, and I'm just introducing myself to you as well. BIMI missionary, I, I, I feel bad about this, but I watched your video, and I, it just stirred me up. You'll get to see a portion of that. And we've been working on this uh, every uh, we started last week hearing Brother Stelzer going to Boston. Uh, they're going to New York. Uh, Brother Larson's going to be with us next Sunday night. We're going to be accenting the big cities of America. And you say, well, why are we doing this? It's a foreign missions conference. That flag right there in the middle, that American flag right there in the middle, it means a lot to the world that has not heard the gospel. And now I'm going to show you what I think our part is, folks. America, we're losing it in America. Our culture is infiltrating our churches, is destroying our churches. I'm going to tell you why tonight. In Big City Night, you're going to hear from him, and uh, we'll say a word about that. And we're going to get off of it, and then we're going to look at the world. Many of these are missionaries going to Africa this week, but you're going to hear them. How many of you uh, participated in Christmas this year? Hold your hand. Christmas for a missionary. Put it up real high. Christmas for a missionary. Okay, I'm going to tell you this, Brother Dice. Oh, you're going to enjoy Christmas tonight. I know it's not time for that, but then every night you'll get to come and you'll get to enjoy Christmas for our missionaries, hear their burden, and hear a message from the preached Word of God. Now, back this card. Hold it up now. Look at it. Pray over it because we're going to ask you to fill this out. And this little portion right here is the one that we want. It does not have your name on it. This is between you and the Lord. And we want you to make that decision. You'll put your decision on this card. And this is the one that you want to place in your Bible to remind you what you said you would give for the year. Or this is the one you'll put in your refrigerator as you make out your tithe check each week. Your, your mission is not your tithe, but there is a place on our giving envelopes for your faith promise missions. By the way, our church collectively will give nearly $600,000 nearly that with what comes in right here and then also those of you who designate and so I, I need you to treat this card young people and old like as solid gold brother Schuler will be be uh, uh, motivating our young our, our children to give as well they have their own card but I want you to make a big deal out of this we'll be saying more about it as time goes on let's stand together please now for the reading of God's word that's a lot of information but this is this is a conference this is a business meeting you might say for the next few days to determine what you and I will do for those who have never heard the gospel. And can I say our big cities in America is part of that. And I want you to catch a burden for that as well. And uh, let's look at uh, chapter 3. Now, by the way, I have the unique burden to do a couple things. First of all, we started a series a couple weeks ago entitled The Gift of God. And the subtitle for that series is A Biblical Understanding of the Eternal Salvation of the Believer. That means we're talking about the great doctrine of the eternal security of the believer. How many say, I'm glad that God does the saving, amen. amen. So I'm going to kind of continue that today because a lot of you are interested in this topic. And uh, I want you to know that there's no such thing as save, loss, save, loss, save, loss. God doesn't forgive me one time and forgets to forgive me another time. Or he gets mad at me and stops forgiving me. That is not taught anywhere in the Scripture. Someone say amen. amen. So I will somewhat address that today, but I take you to our passage today because I want us to see uh, the mission of God. And so uh, I want to begin reading in verse number 16. I'll take a text, I'll say a word and pray, and we'll dive into this. Look at verse number 16, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. 
I want to draw your attention to verse number 18, strangely, for our text today. Verse 18, let's read that together in unison. Ready? He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This morning I want to speak on this subject, the condemnation of humanity. The condemnation of humanity. And as we start our missions conference today, we'll do so by investigating the most important mission in all the world. That is the mission of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God sent His only begotten Son into this sin-cursed and condemned world to save sinners like you and me. Someone say amen. amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, help us today to see that there are only two types of people in this room this morning. There are only two types of individuals in this world. Those that are condemned to be judged in hell and those who are not condemned. Convict, Lord, please, those here that may be condemned. Convict them of their unbelief that they might be saved. And convict the uncondemned, those that are saved, Convict us for unfaithfulness. Convict those who are living maybe an impure life. And convict all of us for a lack of passion for souls. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. When Jesus was speaking here to Nicodemus, he was talking to him about condemnation. He was talking to him about hell. Jesus was telling this self-righteous man, this very, very religious man, how he could escape the eternal fires of hell. How many say that's a good subject to learn? However, the subject of hell is one of the least openly discussed matters in all of human conversation. People just don't like to think about this awful ending to life. Most are confused about their own state of forgiveness, let alone the state of others around them. And for some, it is hard to believe that a loving God can do this to His creation. Of course, they never think about what His creation has done to Him. For others, they know that the Bible teaches that God forgives, but He's not blind. And how could a holy God forgive all the sins that they've committed? And even some preachers sadly understand that hell is such a negative subject that it can drive people away and they have limited their conversation and preaching on hell and some have completely stopped preaching on hell because of, of its negativity. But a Pew research, recent Pew Research poll declares that nearly 60% of Americans believe there is a hell. This tells me something. That is this, that though people may not talk about hell, most people have a fear of going there when they die. Well, who are the ones that are condemned to hell? Who are the ones that shall perish as Jesus declares in John 3, 16 that we have a way of not perishing or not being condemned in hell? That's a great question. It's certainly one to think about. God himself knows the answer. I believe that God knows the answer. And the answer is found in the Word of God before us. The Bible is very clear that it is not the desire of God that anyone is condemned. I want to get that down right at the very beginning because there is this huge concept in America that believes that God would never condemn anybody to hell because He's too loving. Can I say that God's not the one that wanted to condemn me? And I'll show you that in just a moment. We've already quoted in a previous message, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, but I read again here, and that is this. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So from the get-go, we understand that God wants everybody to be saved, not just in America, but in the entire world. We also know that according to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, that everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. 
It was never in the intention of God to condemn anyone to hell. That place was prepared for the devil and his angels. Someone say amen right there. But even here in John 3, 17, we begin to understand that it was never God's intention to, uh, to uh, send anyone to hell. He says that he sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So never get in your head that God is so sinister and so eager to cast people into this place called hell. So then who is condemned? What separates the ones who go on to eternal life from the ones who are condemned in hell? Well, just by way of introduction, let's discuss that for just a moment. Is, the, is it uh, those who commit severe sins? The bad ones. Well, which are the bad ones? The Bible does not delineate between big sins and little sins. We do. Some denominations or religious affiliations will classify sins as venial sins and mortal sins, the good ones and the bad ones. But James chapter 4, verse 17 says this, says this, Therefore to him that doeth good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So now we got the good ones and the bad ones that declare us sinners. Again, in 1 John 3, 4, the Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin, it transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. So we've got all of this sin, the good ones and the bad ones, all of them are transgression against Almighty God. Now, the Bible does give us a list of really severe sins. I don't want to negate that, but again, it states how we're forgiven from those. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But listen, it goes on, verse 11, And such were some of you. But you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. All three theological uh, thoughts are taught here. That is the theory of uh, the thought of being sanctified, the thought of being justified, the thought of being sealed uh, by the Holy Spirit of God to the day of redemption. All those are taught here, and that happens the moment we trust Christ our Savior. Even to those who stood at the foot of the cross, think about this. Guilty of murdering the very Son of God, Jesus said this about them in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them. Finish her with me before they what? Have you ever thought about that statement? The people that were murdering Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus himself, who is God, looked down and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These people crucifying Jesus had no clue of how big a sin they were actually committing that day. Now, the Bible clearly says, that is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10, and all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, and Romans 5.12 states that we're all born sinners, and sinners sin. Dogs bark, ducks quack, sinners sin. So we get that out of the way. So it's not the big ones, the little ones. So, okay, who is not the, those who commit severe sins? Is it those who, who, who commit or repeat sins? Well, I sure hope this one don't get you. Now that we know that there is no difference between big sins and little sins, now we know we're all sinners, we're born sinners, and sinners sin, then we sure wouldn't want to go to hell because we keep committing those little sins over and over. <laughs> so you see, we like... Stick with me. We like to think, oh, man, that guy that murdered all, all those people, they, uh, that person, they need to burn in hell. They just need to fry. What about gossip? What about lying? What about cheating? What about those? What about malice? What about pride? No prideful people in here, right? You see how, you see how we think? Let me just say this. How many thank God that God doesn't think like that? And so, uh, so is it the repeat sins? Yet, uh, humanly, uh, human reason, uh, people think that a person that's saved should, should never sin and certainly should never commit sins over and over again. And this way of thinking, uh, I just want to just scream and say, what part of being a sinner do you not understand? You see, Jesus teaches us that we're to respond to others when they, when they uh, sin uh, repeatedly the same way he responds to us when we sin repeatedly. 
Luke 17, 3 says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and, and, and seven times in a day, turn again and, and to thee, saying, I repent, then thou shalt forgive him. That's the kind of God we serve. So for those of you who think, well, I'm not going to heaven because of the severity of my sin, or I'm not going to heaven because of the repetitiveness of my sin, can I just say that all of your sins were sins before you were ever born. Those are the ones that Jesus died for. By the way, no one has a license to sin. I'll be preaching on that a little later on. You're not going to like that one. God has a way of dealing with believers who sin over and over again, but if they are a true child of God, God doesn't condemn them to hell. All right, here we go. Here's the, here's the message. Okay, preacher, then who is saved from condemnation? Look at verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him. Would you say with me this? That whosoever believeth in him. Say it with me. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word perish is talking about your, the, your, your mode of death that starts your condemnation. Perish shall not perish look at verse 18 he that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god can i just say this is as clear as you're ever going to get it this morning you say preacher who is it that uh, is saved from condemnation right just down first of all number one we see the saving of whosoever <laughs> i love that word whosoever the saving of whosoever whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, verse 16. Now, so the word whosoever literally means that anyone can be saved, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no one has to be condemned, red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight, all nations, all races can be saved from the condemnation of hell. So how many believe that? Say amen. We need to start living that. Americans are not the only ones that get saved. The whole world can be saved. Then Jesus defines this clearly to Nicodemus in verse 18. This self-righteous man, this religious man comes to him. He wants to know how he can go to heaven. And Jesus defines very clearly in verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Say it with me together. Ready? He that believeth on him is not condemned. Does it get any clearer than that? Jesus did not give Nicodemus a list of sins to keep himself from. Jesus did not give him a list of severe sins to avoid. When Jesus told Nicodemus to believe in him, those hard theological passages in Galatians and Hebrews that skeptics uh, like to use uh, about eternal security and take them out of context, they hadn't even been written yet. He did not talk to him about predestination. He did not talk to him about the perseverance of the saints. Jesus just said, the way to not be condemned and sent to hell is by believing in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. Now, you say, preacher, you're being way too overly simplistic today. Yes, I am. And, I, and you say, preacher, you're being a little redundant. Yes, I am. For those of you who are saved and secure, in just a moment, I'm going to shake you up. But there are those among us who don't have this thing settled. They have doubts, they have fears, and understand that Jesus is the one that does the saving. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God is raised from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Romans 8, 1, There is therefore no, uh, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but it's passed from death unto life. We have missionaries sitting among us that are, many of them heading to the region of Africa. They've never heard of Jesus Christ. And they're going to go in and give them the simple gospel of Jesus Christ down on the cross, buried three days, and raised and again from the grave the third day. And they're going to teach them how they can be saved. They're not going to know anything about those contextual passages that, that some use to distort the gospel. They know nothing, nothing about that. And thank God for the purity of the gospel that every missionary takes into those regions. You and I in America, in the American church, have become so sophisticated, especially here in the South. But the Dice is here today who is going to New York City, and he is in an area that has, doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ from Santa Claus. 
There are places in America they don't know who Jesus is. They're a melting pot of many cultures and religions and ideas and philosophies. I'm going to preach on that tonight. And understand that right here in our own nation, they've never heard the simplicity of the gospel. And let's you and I quit distorting it. Let's quit making it so difficult. Let's quit making it. The Bible says that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Is that what the Bible says? So whosoever believes puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Number two, write this down. Not just the saving of the whosoever. Number two, the spurning of the wicked. The spurn of the wicked, to spurn means to have contempt or to disdain or to reject. There are a lot of people in our nation that understand who Jesus is. They understand who God is. But that doesn't mean they're born again. Look what the Bible says in verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. The Bible clearly says that there are those who do not believe. They hear about Christ. Maybe they get the opportunity to. They hear about Christ's ability to save them <clears throat> from a devil's hell, but they spurn that. They reject that. They, some will hold it in disdain or contempt. And here the Bible says that they are condemned already. I made this statement in my prayer. That is this. There are those sitting in this room that you're either condemned or you're not condemned. There's only two types of individuals. There are those in Africa today that are condemned or not condemned. There are those in every nation in all over this world. There are, there are only two types. Those who are condemned, those who are not condemned, and those who are not condemned are those who believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And if you're one of those, you ought to be shouting glory right now. But there are those today, some have heard and they've rejected and some have never heard. And the Bible says they're condemned already. That's sad. But it's what the Bible teaches. Verse 19 again, this verse just comes right out and says it. This is the condemnation. What condemned them, preacher? Well, here it is. Light came into the world. Jesus Christ, who is the light, the gospel shines on them. The truth comes their way. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of the light. Why, preacher? Because their deeds were evil. To this day, not just in our nation, but around this world, humanity loves their sin more than they love God. And let me just stop and caution you right here in this age of apostasy right now that's moving really, really fast in our world. There are a lot of people that's walking away from what they said they believed. And I'll address that sometime real soon, not this morning. But you better be careful of the infiltration of the world into your life. Light has come in the world. If you, if you never see yourself as a sinner, you'll never see your need for the Savior. And America is becoming darker and darker by the day. And people are adjusting to the darkness and they're tolerating the perverted wickedness uh, of, of sins of humanity more and more and more. And can I say, I'm watching as a pastor creep into the church rapidly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not preaching on this right now, but I'm going to talk for just a moment to the ones of you who believe and you're not condemned. God saved you from the slop of this world. We have no right or business going right back into the world. We're supposed to come out from among them, be you separate, saith the Lord. And I just want to say that you and I will never have the power of God on us like we need for soul winning and for reaching world through world through world missions if you and I don't get separated from this world. God saved you and that Jesus Christ died for those sins and you and I have no right to go back out into the world. That's another message. But the world spurns this. We should take note here that they love their darkness and their sins condemn them. We should take note that God is not the one that does the condemning. A man condemns himself with his own heart and his own lips as he denies the Savior, the light that's come to him. When he refuses to believe him and trust him as Savior. Oh, we lay an awful lot of cynical scorn at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ who came in this world and gave himself for mankind. Whosoever means you today, don't spurn that. 
don't reject that and then number three if you'll allow me now i got as your pastor i got to take this thing and turn it so you stick with me we'll turn this ship real quick we see number one we see the who's saving of the whosoever number two the spurning of the wicked number three the savior for the world and look at the text in our text the word world is mentioned five times verse 16 god loved the world verse 17 god sent his son into the world verse 17 god desires not to condemn the world verse 17 again god desires that the world would be saved verse 19 god sent his light in the world look at verse 19 with me together and this is the condemnation the light is come into the world now, i'm gonna tell you what you're not gonna get away from this no one is going to get away from this nobody light is come into the world I don't have time to build on that theologically but understand that light has to do with Jesus and the gospel and the truth and light has come in the world God loves the people of this world and he wants them to be saved now watch this Jesus who is the light of the world is resurrected from the grave he's seated in heaven and you and I now are the light of the world Jesus said this in Matthew 5 24 ye are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven you see god wants everyone to hear we learn that in school in sunday school this little light of mine sing with me this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine sing it i'm gonna let it shine let it shine let it shine let it shine hide it under i'm gonna let it shine i'm gonna let it shine let it shine let it shine let it shine don't let satan blow it out i'm gonna let it shine light has come into the world jesus christ is seated at the right hand of the father on high paul said you and i are set to be lights no matter where you are at your workplace where you go to college at no matter in your community no matter where you are in your family for thanksgiving you may be the only saved person sitting around that table but you are the light to those people you're sitting around that missionary that's going into those those dark areas are the light of jesus christ i refer you back to just last week when we touched on this briefly in romans chapter 10 how then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of, of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a what and how shall they preach except they be what that's what this conference is about how many born again say amen and you say amen now raise your hand or something how many you're saved say amen our light is to shine Brother Eric Bowman said it so very well. He held up, uh, where you at, Brother Eric? You in here? You held up the, the mission card, and you, what was the other one? Our track, and you said what? Say it again. Go here, send there. You and I are to go here, and we're to send there. Now, with that in mind, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And I'm almost finished. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We'll be right on time. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I want you to read this verse, verse with me together in unison. This is our job. This takes us from Murfreesboro to Gambia, Mozambique, wherever we're going to New York. Verse number 8. Let's read this together in unison. Verse 8. Ready? But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria and under the other most part of the earth that was the mission that was given five times in Scripture here's given for the fifth time these are the words of our Lord if you have a red lettered edition of the Bible you'll see that Jesus is making this statement just before he ascends back to glory he leaves us with our mission three po points to this and I'm finished number one he gives us the plan Number two, he gives us the purpose. And number three, he gives us the power. The plan is this. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. Say it with me together. Jerusalem, Judea, 
Samaria, the uttermost. Let me explain to you pretty much what he was telling them. He said, I want you right here. I want you to win souls right there in Murfreesboro in Jerusalem. That's our job. We're to go right here. I'll say more about that tonight. Then he said, I want you to go to Judea. That's the, that's the spread out region. We can say, well, that's Rutherford County. That's Tennessee. There's only so far reach our church can have, but that's, that's the area. Or maybe our nation. That's our Judea. Then he used this word Samaria. What did that mean? Samaria, Samaria was a, another region, but it was a region of, of intermarriage and a mixed uh, cultures and so forth. It was, a, it was an area that the Jew did not like to go through. Jesus said this, I must needs go through Samaria. He said, I've got to go there. Those are the areas in our own culture right here in Murfreesboro and in America right now that you and I cannot use our profiled idea as a Christian we cannot use that God forbids us to do that that means we go to hard areas of tough cases we do that while some the word both is used while simultaneously we go into the uttermost parts of the world some of you are saying, why don't we just stop and take care of America? Preacher, by the way, a lot of churches do this. Why don't we just stop and take care of our church? We spend all this money everywhere else. To stop. To, do you understand, preacher, how, how much we can do with that money? If we just leave it, that money will not even be here if we just left it right here because God wouldn't let us have it. One of our men said the other day in men's prayer breakfast just yesterday morning, he said, preacher, when are we going to understand that whenever we need something right here, we just give more to missions and God just puts it right back in here? I cannot tell you and I cannot explain, humanly speaking, what God has done with our finances. And he's doing that because we have a giving church and, and we, we want more, we need more. May we give more. Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other one. That is the plan. The purpose, if you write this down somewhere, is to witness. Dr. Lee Robertson used to say this, a witness tells what he knows. What you and I are doing is to take the good news of the gospel and tell others about that. How you got saved. Brother Phil Wheeler, I'm not sure if he's here this morning or not, he just finished up his last fair, uh, state fair ministry. I don't know exactly how many had saved total. I think it's in the 400s, but I think 128 just saved yesterday. Giving out the gospel to those who came by witnessing tell those about Christ and here's the power somebody says how can you do that what right do I have you and I are an ambassador of Jesus Christ and the authority and the power backing that witness that good news of the gospel is the power of the Holy Spirit of God that when it came down on Pentecost 3,000 folks got saved and the gospel spread and that comes that power comes when you and I begin living that pure life one more time we turn from being inward and we turn outward to other people. So you have it. Which are you this morning? Of the condemned or of the not condemned? Do you believe Jesus Christ is your Savior? You put your faith and trust in Him? Then you're of the not condemned. Now remember the Bible teaches us that we're not to judge others, Luke 6, 37, lest we be condemned. I'm talking about you right now right now the difference you put your faith you believed in Jesus Christ that he's literally the son of God he died for your sins he was buried three days and he rose again the third and you are willing to put your faith and trust in that fact and that love to take you to heaven that's it it's not a matter of severe sin or repetitive sin or some other theological loophole that's going to get you in. I, I, I don't want you as a church, I don't want you to say, well, I just hope I make it. Preacher, I hope I make it. Ladies and gentlemen, you will make it if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that's what the world needs to hear. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and no one's looking around this morning. Let me just say to Christians today, if you're forgiven and not condemned we need to renew our witnessing we need to get the power of the Holy Spirit of God on us one more time and I want to challenge you in that today there's a world that needs to hear starting in Jerusalem starting at Murfreesboro when we begin this missions conference would you ask God to help you do a better job telling others about Christ with their heads bowed or eyes closed and no one looking around here's the invitation 
if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you remember the day that you did that, then by the grace of God, you'll not be judged. You'll not be condemned. God has nothing against you because of the precious blood of Christ. Say, preacher, I remember the day that I did that. Would you put your hand up real high as a testimony? I remember the day that I did that. I remember the day I got saved. Thank you. Put your hands down. If you cannot raise your hand right there, can I say that I want you to come to the Lord. And I promise you in heaven, they're waiting to rejoice as you do that. Would you let me pray for you? If you could not lift your hand right there, would you just let me pray for you? I want to help you. I want to help you come to Christ. How many say this, preacher, I don't know that for sure, but I, I want you to pray for me. I need to take care of that today. No one's looking right now. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I would not embarrass you. I wouldn't call your name out. I promise you that. You say, preacher, I'm struggling with that. I don't know that for sure. Would you lift your, lift your hand let me pray for you? Anybody like that? I'll just put your hand right up, right back down. I want to pray for you. Not sure that I'm born again. Not sure that I'm born again. All right, let's stand together with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. It's missions conference, folks. Let's be honest with God. Let's do a better job at getting that light out there. Turn the light on. Just come and find yourself a place here. Lord, help me to turn the light on again. Help me do a better job at witnessing, telling folks about Christ. Father, bless, please, this invitation. And I pray you'll fire us up about our job. If not this morning, Lord, soon our city needs to hear the gospel. Our family members need to hear the gospel. And help us to be empowered and moved by thee, we pray. And for these who are not sure they're saved, I pray they'll help them to come to Jesus Christ today. And bless this invitation. We start our conference in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing right now. You come, would you? These altars are open. Come.